Since the beginning of time, women have had to overcome prejudices and fight for their rights. From Nefertiti, powerfully ruling Egypt, to Joan of Arc, leading France to victory, to Malala, pushing for women's educational rights. Women have valiantly challenged the limitations put upon them. Katherine Houghton Hepburn and her daughter, the famous actress Katherine Hepburn, both challenged the standards put upon them to join the army that shaped a woman's world today. Katherine Houghton Hepburn, or Kit as her family called her, was born in 1878 in Corning, New York. Her family founded the Corning Glassworks Company, a lucrative business that brought them wealth and notoriety in the area. Her parents were very progressive thinkers and encouraged their three daughters to be the same. Catherine graduated Bryn Mawr, class of 1899, with a Bachelor of Arts in History and Chemistry, and went on to get her master's degree in Physics and Chemistry from Radcliffe College. After graduation, Kit Houghton met Tom Hepburn when he was a medical student at Johns Hopkins, and the two married and moved to Hartford, Connecticut. Between 1905 and 1918, Tom and Kit had six kids, including the famous actress Catherine Hepburn. Kit and Tom taught their children well. Every day at five, the tight-knit family would have tea and discuss Shakespeare, Shaw, and various issues of the day. They raised intelligent children who were exposed to all controversial topics. Kate Hepburn later said, I'm just something from New England that was very American and brought up by two extremely intelligent people who gave us the greatest gift that man can give anyone, freedom from fear. While many people scorn Kit and Tom's household openness and their audacious discussions on improper subjects, the family was strong-willed and continued to inspire independence in their progeny. In 1909, women still did not have the vote. Kit Hepburn would not stand for this. She stopped teaching and spent her time fighting for the women's right to vote. With her friends in Hartford, Hepburn assembled the Hartford Equal Franchise League, which grew rapidly to 20,000 members and was eventually absorbed into the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association, which previously had dropped to merely 50 members. From 1910 to 1917, Hepburn herself served as the president of the CWSA. She organized rallies and demonstrations. In 1914, the first ever suffrage parade was held in Connecticut, with over 2,000 people marching. In this position, Kit wrote many pamphlets on pressing topics of the time. In 1913, she wrote the pamphlet, The Revolution in Women's Work Makes Votes for Women a Practical Necessity. She opened saying, during the past hundred years, there has been a complete revolution in industrial and social conditions. In consequence of this, the position of women and their conditions of work have undergone a change nothing short of revolutionary. Hepburn said that the government ignores the disenfranchised classes and only listen to those who support them. She ends with, For this reason, votes for women is a natural and necessary result of present-day conditions. The pamphlet was published in many states to spur women to fight for their rights. Hepburn spoke at many suffrage meetings and represented the CWSA at multiple conferences, including at the meeting with President Woodrow Wilson. In 1917, Hepburn resigned from the CWSA, complaining that it was outdated and supine, however hard she tried to sway them. Kit allied with Alice Paul and the National Women's Party. Within two months, Kit was appointed as a National Executive Committee member of the party. The council worked for an amendment to the Constitution to grant equal rights to men and women. They spoke at meetings, rallies, and even picketed the White House. After the vote was won with the passing of the 19th Amendment in 1920, Hepburn was offered a run for a seat on the U.S. Senate. Instead, she focused on campaigning against the anti-birth control laws in Connecticut and across the U.S. The Comstock laws forbade obscene material to go through the U.S. mail. And this meant that anything that mentioned sex or birth control could be shut down and confiscated. With this, many states passed additional laws to stop the distribution of contraceptives and any related materials. Connecticut, however, was the only state to pass another law in 1879, banning birth control and requiring a fine and a minimum of two months imprisonment. The only exceptions were condoms, allowed because they prevented disease. We also have a couple examples of contraception. We have three different boxes for condoms, which were already available, but of course relied on cooperation from a, with a male partner. Instead, Margaret Sanger was advocating that women use cervical caps, also called pessaries, which are a precursor to a diaphragm and were inexpensive, safe, and controlled by a woman. Hepburn mocked the Comstock laws, calling them the police under the bed laws. Although she had six children, Hepburn understood that for many poorer women, 
Bearing children was simply an onerous duty, seriously affecting their health, welfare, and psychological development. She stated that Connecticut's laws prohibiting birth control were discriminatory against the lower socioeconomic classes. Wealthy women could find sympathetic doctors or travel to get birth control, but poor women lacked those resources. After being a keynote speaker at the American Conference on Birth Control, Hepburn joined Sanger to help found the National Birth Control League in 1921. Sanger soon appointed Hepburn as a chair on the National Committee on Federal Legislation for Birth Control. On her own, Hepburn created a birth control league in Connecticut. She spoke to the Connecticut legislature many times, each time resulting in rejection of a pro proposed bill. Hepburn also united with Sanger for Washington congressional meetings. Many people were against birth control because it represented a fundamental change in gender roles and sexuality. If you were advocating for birth control, it might mean that you were advocating for extramarital sex, premarital sex, or a change in relationships that gave women more power in their lives. In 1935, Hepburn was instrumental in setting up an illegal birth control clinic at Hartford, but it was forced to shut down. Infuriated, Hepburn led the Connecticut Birth Control League to challenge the archaic law that Hepburn said was designed to prevent immorality and indecency and not to interfere with competent physicians and in protecting the health and well-being of their patients. This eventually led to the court case Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965, which finally abolished the Comstock Laws. While Kit traveled the East Coast arguing for birth control, her daughter, Katherine Hepburn, took Hollywood by storm. Inspired by her mother, Kate also fought for women's rights. Growing up, Kate was notoriously athletic and boyish. She excelled at tennis, swimming, and golf. She was extremely close with her older brother, Tom, and she would tend to hang out with him and his friends. When she was nine, Kate cut her hair and insisted on people calling her Jimmy. She wore boys' clothing as well. Kate went on to Bryn Mawr where her peculiar boyish and sassy attitude and her unusual style was well known. Henry Fonda later remarked, Hepburn is a presence wherever she is. In a room, she is the only one in it. In a big area, she doesn't do anything to dominate. She just does and is. By the time she graduated from Bryn Mawr, Catherine knew she wanted to pursue acting. She bounced from stock company to stock company, performing in plays. After much struggle, Hepburn dominated Hollywood, constantly landing leads. However, multiple bad reviews and movie flops led Catherine to be deemed box office poison. She returned to Broadway and revived her career both there and in the film industry. Throughout her career, Catherine was defiant. She declined playing classic women's roles. She argued for the rights to her own films, for better pay, and for equal treatment. Unlike many of the other starlets at the time, she refused to bathe in the spotlight, and reporters struggled to get a picture, much less an interview. She once grabbed a camera out of a photographer's hand when he tried to take a picture of her without asking. Most renowned was her style. But of as angular and sexless, most people viewed her as too masculine. She dressed very casually in an age of frivolity. In the 1930s, women could be arrested for wearing trousers and masquerading as men. Nevertheless, Hepburn persisted. When RKO, her agency, took her jeans, Hepburn refused to wear a skirt, and instead walked around in her underwear. Similarly, when abroad in London, a hotel manager told her that she could not wear trousers in the lobby, and she promptly asked where the surface entrance was. This bold choice drew attention, and caused a revolution against the status quo. While she was certainly not the first star to wear trousers, Garbo and Dietrich had also dabbled in this style, Hepburn was the only one to wear pants for mobility and comfort rather than fashion, and the trend caught on. Multiple magazines remarked how Hollywood was going Hepburn and more women were wearing pants. I have not lived as a woman. I have lived as a man. Huh. And in a few, well, I've just done what I damn well wanted to, and I made enough money to support myself. And I ain't afraid of being alone. Money, 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 money. Today, we are still fighting for equality for women. We are still fighting for abortion rights, equal pay, and the destruction of harmful stereotypes. We are still fighting for the freedom to walk down a dark street alone, not hear catcalls or remarks, and not fear harassment. But we have come so far. Both Kit Hepburn and her daughter Kate opposed the standards placed upon them and refused to compromise and back down. They battled conflict after conflict, and their revolution is still continuing today.